Today I'm speaking with Scott Barry Kaufman about human well-being. Scott is the author of the book Transcend, The New Science of Self-Actualization. Scott is a humanistic psychologist who has taught at Columbia University, the University of Pennsylvania, New York University, and elsewhere. He writes the column Beautiful Minds for Scientific American, and he hosts the Psychology Podcast. He's also written for The Atlantic and Harvard Business Review, and his previous books include Ungifted, Wired to Create, Twice Exceptional, which he edited, and he also edited the Cambridge Handbook of Intelligence. Anyway, we cover a lot of ground in this episode. We talk about the difference between intelligence and creativity. We talk about wisdom and transcendence, the history of humanistic psychology, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the connection between well-being and ethics, self-esteem, psychedelics and meditation, peak and plateau experiences, mortality salience, the pre-trans fallacy, fear of uncertainty, work and meaning, intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards, pathological altruism, intimacy versus belonging, two aspects of self-transcendence, and other topics. I now bring you Scott Barry Kaufman. I am here with Scott Barry Kaufman. Scott, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me on your show, Sam. So you've written a fascinating book titled Transcend, The New Science of Self-Actualization. And you also have a, a podcast of your own, the Psychology Podcast. Maybe let's start with just a, an introduction to your background in psychology. What sorts of issues have you focused on and, and how do you describe your, your work at this point? Sure. I think we have lots of mutual interests. When I first started off, I got my PhD in cognitive science, in cognitive psychology, and was really interested in the cognition of intelligence. And I actually started off in real traditional intelligence research, so studying IQ testing, and I was absolutely fascinated with what are the cognitive processes underlining intelligence and, and IQ. And then it branched off a little bit to other forms of cognition like implicit learning and unconscious learning. I was curious if unconscious learning was related to conscious learning and whether there was such a thing as unconscious intelligence that would correlate or not correlate with IQ. And that's what my dissertation was on. And then it moved on to creativity work and understanding the distinction and similarities between intelligence and creativity. And then in the past four or five years, I've really gotten into positive psychology and humanistic psychology and trying to understand above just our mind and in human intelligence, but how can we realize our, our whole being, you know, not just one slice of us? Yeah, well, I want to focus mostly on the, the humanistic and positive side of things and talk about self-transcendence and the furthest reaches of human well-being, but maybe we can take a moment to tie it to some of your earlier work. How would you differentiate intelligence creativity and wisdom how do you think oh, about those things yeah it's a great, great 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 question so intelligence i view as the we can just really shorthand it and say it's the ability to apprehend and perceive what is and when i got into imagination research i defined imagination as the ability to apprehend and perceive what could be and so I actually view creativity as a combination of intelligence and, and imagination. So creativity is having the ability to apprehend what is and really learn and understand the, the real true nature of the world without any prior beliefs or, or biases. But we have to go beyond that for creativity. We also have to have that foresight into what society could be, what, what could humans become, you know? And I see creativity as as a combination of, of both intelligence and imagination. Does that make sense? Mm. Creativity is somewhat paradoxical, it seems to me, because if you're too creative, right, if you're not obeying any of the rules, well, then it suddenly becomes worthless or next to worthless. Like you're, you're extracting meaning that is either isn't there or is there only for you, right, but it can't be communicated to others. And so there's this is sort of where 
the psychedelic experience can become obviously not normative and, and not all that useful, even though, and I hope we'll talk about psychedelics as well. But how do you view... I hope so too. Yeah, yeah. How do you view the, the sort of the rule following and, and rule breaking with respect to creativity? Yeah, one of the key aspects of creative people, and, and I did a research project when I was working on this book with the journalist Kylan Gregoire. The book is called Wired to Create. And when I was working on that, I was trying to look to see what do creative people do differently. And one of the most obvious things they do differently is that they do things differently. You know, they, creative people are rule breakers in the sense that maybe they're not necessarily provocateurs. And that's a different kind of rule breaking. And I, and I, I think it's actually important to distinguish between those who are intentional, like I would say compulsive rule breakers versus those who do it as a means to an end for greater meaning and, and creative realization. So then where does wisdom come in? Okay, wisdom is, has been defined in lots of different ways. In the psychological literature, it's been defined uh, lots of, not just through the psychological literature, but throughout the course of human history. But in my book, Transcend, uh, kind of, that, that's the climax. That's, that's where we, we end up and in understanding what wisdom could mean from, from a self-actualization perspective or a transcendence perspective. And I view, view wisdom as really encompassing this dichotomy transcendence that one of my favorite psychologists, Abraham Maslow, talked a lot about. He said, at the highest state of consciousness, lots of dichotomies that everyone else in our society is really interested and obsessed with and these false dichotomies, we, we're able to transcend them in some way and we're able to, to see how everything is just part of a larger whole. This might even have to be a, to make it concrete, it could be like the distinction between selfishness and, and altruism. You know, at the highest level of consciousness, if you're, and being the highest level of, of motivation, if you're selfish in the sense that you're getting really enjoyment out of what you're doing, but you're also connected to the world and, and your enjoyment brings enjoyment to others simultaneously, you know, the word selfishness starts to lose meaning. Evil versus good, you start to have a more realistic understanding of human nature and, uh, and you, on the one hand, can recognize the human frailties, but you also have the capacity to see that there's good in humans, so dialecticals. Wisdom to me is really this ability to hold seemingly incompatible things in your head, as well as with, with yourself, recognize your own contradictions hmm. and, and see and, and zoom out on yourself and see all those contradictions as part of a integrated whole that that could be integrated. My gosh, if you can find a way to take all these warring factions that exist within ourselves, we were evolved to be that way. You know, there was no unitary system that that in, through the course of human evolution that that tried to um, make sure that we were integrated humans. But my gosh, these humans who exist who can work towards integration and and feeling inner wholeness to some degree. Those those are very wise people in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well so let's talk about your book and how you sort of scale that mountain where wisdom is the the place one hopes to arrive. Why has positive psychology and humanistic psychology and the various branches that I'm not sure how stable these labels are now, but why has the positive side of the human experience traditionally been given such little attention in psychology. I mean, I know that's changed of late with with Seligman, perhaps you know, first in in my lifetime. But and you know, as you show in your book, we had people like Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers and other people who go who went by the label humanistic psychology, struggling to focus on this. And is it a legacy of sort of what Freud did to our thinking about the <laughs> prospects of human happiness. How do you view the, the last you know, century or so of psychology's emphasis on all that is wrong with the human mind or potentially wrong and basic ignorance of the possibility of things going right with the mind? Well, you know, I, I, I long believe that we should have listened to William James and not Freud. Mm. You know, we should have listened to uh, in some senses, the, um, the, the originator of research psychology or empirical data psychology. A lot of Freud's ideas were very armchair and were 
ironically, projections of his own soul, so mm. to speak, or his own issues, projecting that onto all of humanity. But you ask a very good question because humanistic psychology was quite popular in, in a 10 to 20 year period in 50s, 60s. It caught the time of hippies, the sort, sort of spirit of the 60s and, you know, LSD and the beat writers, all this sort of idea of creativity and spirituality. It was, it was part of the, the culture. And, you know, I, I, I am trying to, I try to think why it died out and because it did die out from like the 70s till Martin Seligman really brought, brought it back in a, in a big way by putting positive psychology on a scientific foundation in 1998 or so. And what happened between the 70s and 1998? Well, it, you know, there's lots of ways of trying to answer that question. One way is recognizing that the bad is stronger than the good. We are more focused on when we have deprivations and, and there's certainly no shortage of deprivations among humans to, to work on, depression, anxiety, these things become more pressing concerns for us when we're in that deprived state. If we're feeling satisfied, we don't seek a therapist so that we are, you know, even more satisfied. I mean, if you mm -hmm. go to a therapist and you say, doc, I only feel average life satisfaction, but I want to be like these pop psychology, I want to be, you, you find something else, you find a coach maybe, or you find a, you don't go to a therapist for that, you know, not clinical psychology, not right. psychology, you, you know what I'm saying. So the bad is stronger than good in a lot of ways. And, and it isn't important, you know, the a purpose of the field of psychology, the state admission of the APA and, and what I think psychology should be about is improving human life and, and improving human life. It's, there's, there, like I said, there's no shortage of suffering. So that, that can take up a lot of it. So yeah, I, I don't know the exact answer to that question, but I, I think part of it is connected to the, uh, the spirit of the, the times in the fifties and sixties mm -hmm. and. We don't really have that 60s spirit right now, do we? Yeah, well, the 60s died in various ways and for some reasons that make sense. I mean, there, there was a, an explosion of dysfunction in addition to all the enthusiasm and insight. There was a fair amount of dysfunction and, and chaos being advertised. And it's just, you know, I'm a big proponent of the wise use of psychedelics, as you probably know, but the haphazard use of them obviously comes with its a significant risk and you know that risk was borne out in in many people's lives i had another thought and that's that you know they're they're definitely outside of psychology was there's there was no lack of the tony robbins of the world or 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 books on how to be your best self how to realize your potential so outside of psychology you know in the pop help and and i wonder if to a certain extent the field of psychology which likes to see itself itself as a like physics you know like a science at least a lot of psychologists do were really put off by, you know, mm. by that world and wanted to distinguish itself from, you know, we're not self-help, you know, woo-woo, you know, we're, we're more scientific. And I just wonder if that has part to do with it as well. Yeah, I think it does. And also the explicit religious and Eastern influence on humanistic psychology. I, mean, I know we'll, we'll get into this, but people like Maslow were influenced by teachers like Krishnamurti or Buddhist writers like Alan mm -hmm. Watts and the sort of brain trust for this movement, you know, positive psychology before it called itself positive, would often meet at places like Esalen Institute. And, you know, that became a hub for the new age. And it gathered, you know, all of these influences, you know, some of which are, are really the antithesis of science. I once taught a, a weekend at Esalen a long time ago, but Simultaneous with that, you know, I'm sure there were things in the catalog like, you know, how crystals can balance your chakras and the sky's the limit in terms of what people will <laughs> believe in the esoteric vein, you know, whether Eastern or, or Western in its influence. And it's, you know, it has a, it has much more in common with traditional religion than it does with scientific rigor. And so the stink of the new age on all of this is probably what academic psychology is, is reacting to as well. I think that's right. And that stigma is still there. Sometimes when you say you, you, you do research in positive psychology, these are some sectors of psychologists that look down on that as maybe not as scientific or rigorous. Right, right. Okay, so now people have heard of Maslow, if they haven't really heard of him as a person or even humanistic psychology, most people have heard of his hierarchy of needs. and this is one of these exports from somebody's work that 
got somewhat falsified in the in the transit to the rest of culture. So what is it that people think they know about this pyramid and what is it that Maslow thought he was teaching about it? Well, a lot of people may have seen the pyramid. They may not even heard the name Abraham Maslow, but certainly they've they've seen it on the internet, maybe diagrammed as a pyramid with like now you see toilet paper at the bottom of the pyramid hmm. or in the age of COVID or or Wi Fi battery was popular before that. It's a meme. And suggesting there's different levels of needs. Some are more foundational than others. And Maslow's original theory, he never drew a pyramid or in his writings. And I mean, I was looking through the writings. I was like, where's the pyramid? Where's mm-hmm. I, I didn't I couldn't find a pyramid. And he was talking about a hierarchy of prepotency. We have some needs that are more prepotent or, over others that when they're deprived, they take up more of our attention. And we really focus all of our energy and resources to to satisfying that. So he argued at the at the base, although it's not a pyramid, but our most prepotent need, I should say, is the need, physiological needs like food, shelter, water. And then the next prepotent need is the need for love and belonging, according to Maslow. And then the next the next prepotent need is the need for esteem, esteem from others as well as self-esteem. And then the argument was if we could have these needs, these basic needs met, then we can really be free to self-actualize, to become all that uh, we're uniquely capable of becoming. You know, all of those basic needs are things that we share with other animals, and we also share with other humans. So it doesn't make you particularly special if you say, I'm lonely, you know, or I'm hungry, or I want respect. Yeah, stand in line. Everyone wants respect. You know, so, but if you start to say something like, I can play a violin concerto, like no one else in the world can play a violin concerto. Now we're starting to talk about self-actualization. You know, what is this unique core potentiality within you that can make the greatest positive impact on the world? And that's what I think he meant by self-actualization. That's the original theory, but there was no pyramid. He actually made it very clear that, that life wasn't like this kind of video game. He never used that metaphor, but I use that metaphor in the sense that you don't reach one level of need, like the need for belonging. And then some voice from above is like, congrats, you've unlocked the need for esteem. And then you can go up a level, mm. like some, and then you never have to worry about connection ever again. He made it very clear that life is a, always a two-step forward, one-step back dynamic, where we're always choosing growth. We're always trying to choose growth, but, but the fear response is always prepotent. You know, fear is always going to loom over us in, in uncertainty. But we have to consciously keep choosing the growth option. He made that very clear. And then it's germane to this idea that we're both interested in with transcendence. He argued that the last couple of years of his life that self-actualization wasn't the highest motivation in his hierarchy of needs, that there was a higher motivation. In fact, he realized that there were different types of self-actualizing people. This is an insight he wrote in a journal, personal journal entry of his that I found. He, he, he's like, big insight today. I realized that there are actually different types of self-actualizing people. There are self-actualizers who are perfectly perfectly content going their entire lives, realizing their own potential. And, you know, maybe they read all the books, how to realize your full potential. They're obsessed with realizing their potential and maximizing their potential, but they really don't care much about maximizing the potential of society or maximizing the potential of others. There's not a great connection between self and others. They may dazzle with their talents and or at work, they may be doing good, good work, and they feel self-actualized. But they're not what Maslow called the transcenders. He argued that transcenders were a different kind of self-actualizers who were consistently motivated by higher values. He called them the B values, the values of being itself, things where there's no means to an end. They're ends in themselves, like the, the search for beauty, the search for, for justice, for meaningfulness in the world, for goodness. and and, and you're motivated by these values, but also you're motivated by peak experiences in life. So these sort of spiritual, I guess you call them transcendent experiences in your life. And, and these transcenders, this is what they, they lived for, is these kinds of experiences and the realization of these kinds of values. Yeah, that, that opens up a lot of interesting questions because you know, many of us who are in the, the transcendence business have noticed that there is a the connection between so-called peak experiences or even you know more durable experiences of self-transcendence 
which do seem normative within their purview. I mean, they, they, they have beneficial effects psychologically. They, you know, they mitigate psychological suffering. But the connection to ethics and you know, commitment to an intelligent commitment to helping other people, say, the kind of normative pro-social emotions in action, that is, I think it's there. It, it's certainly advertised to be there in, in, in an Eastern context, especially in a Buddhist one, especially. But it's not as direct or as reliable as I think we would hope. And, and you know, to testify to that fact, all you need to do is look at the careers of great meditators and you know, teachers of meditation who have gathered students. Many of them have come from Eastern countries and come to the West to teach. And this was obviously happening in, in Maslow's time. And so many of them have produced incredible suffering among their students and mixed messages, to put it charitably, with respect to their teaching, because they, you know, they become, in many cases, we're probably talking about fraud. You know, these people are not who they say they are. But in the most interesting cases, I don't think that is what's happening. I think the, we're talking about people who have genuine insights, genuine access to fairly rarefied states of mind. These are not people who are failed meditators or failed yogis. These are, again, to one degree or another, spiritual athletes, but who still have whatever level of narcissism and ego needs and just unfulfilled desires that lead them to misbehave sometimes with the abandon of a, um, you know, a rock star trashing a hotel room. And it's left many people thinking that there's no there there, which is a a real integration of self-transcending wisdom and ethics that survive the, the normal tests, free of paradox that strains one's sanity and actually just leads people to be good and reliably harmless in proximity to others. And so that, you know, I, I've come away from my, my collisions with this literature and to some degree these people feeling that there's more needed in the toolkit for you know, living a, a truly examined life and becoming a better person than just having certain self-transcending experiences. I mean, certainly I think the peak experience is the wrong model. I mean, whatever, whatever the peak is, it comes, it goes. It's not the ultimate insight into the nature of consciousness that will transform you because it, by definition, it came and it went. But what's needed is, is an actual conscious integration with ethics that makes sense. And this is where culture comes in and just the relationship between the individual and society, right? So it's just, yes, it's possible to have real breakthroughs privately in, the, in solitude, but when one comes out and interacts with the rest of the world, what one has to do that with are, by definition, one's beliefs, assumptions, you know, one's culture on some level. And, you know, in the Eastern case, you've had many of these people come from effectively theocracies with all of those norms and, and have used those norms as a template through which to interact with people. And that, that hasn't worked out so well. So anyway, I realize I've dumped a lot on you, but I, just, I guess I'm interested to know what you think about the larger footprint of wisdom and how it relates to things like self-transcendence and peak experience and the general project of becoming a better person. Yeah, there's there's a lot there, and I've spent some, a lot of time was when I was writing this book thinking about pseudo transcendence. What does pseudo transcendence look like? Maslow actually talked about pseudo growth. He mm -hmm. talked about people who tried to jump to the top of his hierarchy of needs without having without addressing their other needs, thinking that it'll somehow if they just meditate or if they just do LSD or they do spiritual practices, then suddenly they don't they won't have these abiding concerns anymore that they had. He called that pseudo growth. So in my book, I try to distinguish between pseudo transcendence and healthy transcendence. So everything, so this is a framework which I, that Maslow used, but I started to see the whole world in that way. Everything, so nothing in and of itself is good or bad. Everything has a D flavor to it and a B flavor to it. So the D flavor is a deficiency motivated flavor to it. So you do it because you're trying to satisfy some hole in yourself in some way. And, and anything can apply to that. You can have 
the humor versus is being or growth motivated humor. Love, you can have de- or belonging, you can have de-belonging where you have a desperate need to belong with others because you severely lack belonging and you're trying to change and control the world in some way or be belonging where you see people for who they are or, or be love, love for the being of others, not what use they can, they, they, they exist to satisfy some hole in yourself. So I think the big key is recognizing that there, that integration is what, is what matters here. And I have a section in my book called the Hitler problem. So when I get to the need for purpose, I ask, well, uh, was Hitler self-actualized because he clearly had a sense of purpose. He had a purpose. I'm arguing purpose is a higher level of need. The point here is that life is not like a mountain or a pyramid, like it's been depicted in Maslow's. I actually have a new metaphor, a sailboat. And in a sailboat model, and the reason why I think it works, and I'd love to get your, your thoughts on that, is that it, it clearly shows that you need to have a safe and secure boat. Your basic needs need to be met. There's no holes in the boat, no, no severely deprived aspects of your needs, or else you won't go anywhere. You can't move in your desired direction when all you're focused on is securing the boat. And for the boat, I, I talk about the needs for, uh, for safety, the needs for connection, and the need for self-esteem. But once our boat is secure, we can open the sail and we open the sail and, and face the vulnerability and, and the unknown of the sea. We move with purpose and direction with that sail, but we move with integration of the spirit of exploration, not fear, and love, universal love, or what Maslow called be love, love for the being of others. It's moving in that purposeful direction, but with an integration of these other things. So the, the whole point here is that we operate as a, as a whole vehicle experiencing the unknown of the sea, even though we each move in our own direction with our own purpose, there can be a great unknown, a great wave can come crashing down on all the boats at once. And then suddenly we were all moving our own direction. And now we realize, wait a minute, we're all actually in the same sea together. So I, I think this metaphor works in a number of ways better than the static pyramid. And also the pyramid doesn't show that the, the point here of wisdom is is the integration aspect. So people who appear as though they're trans, or will tell you because they're gurus or that you know that I'm a transcendent being, you know, and they then they go abuse people in there or do whatever, whatever they whatever you know. You see, you see all these atrocities from people who say they're enlightened. Not all, of course, but you you, you know the kinds you point you point out. I would argue that they're pseudo transcending. They have built their spiritual practices on a very faulty foundation. They're, they still have unresolved, deeply unresolved belonging needs or deeply unresolved safety needs or esteem needs. You know, they, they, they desperately need esteem. And so it's built on a very faulty foundation. So that's why I think that this healthy transcendence model I, I talk about in the book, I specifically define as healthy transcendence is defined as the harmonious integration of the whole self in the service of realizing the good society. That's how I define healthy transcendence, to make clear that it's the connection between self and world, not being above the world in some way. My conceptualization of transcendence might differ from other people's notions of transcendence, but I wanted to make it very clear that it wasn't a horizontal thing. It's not like we're transcending other people in some sense. It, it, it's actually quite the opposite. Healthy transcendence is when we have this great unity with the world. Yeah, well, I think the sailboat analogy is really a good one, and it, I mean, I could see it break down at one point at, at the extreme end of, of transcendence, really, where, where the things that seem to be needs for most of us, certainly most of the time, which is, you know, the things that are part of the whole, you know, the deficiency needs, the safety, the connection, the self-esteem, it really is possible, or certainly seems to be possible to transcend those in some basic sense. Now, that's, that's not really a norm you can recommend to other people, but it does seem like a way of resolving some of the paradoxes you, you mentioned, you know, that Maslow was focused on, or, or seeming paradoxes, or, or, or yeah. the dialectic between extremes, where if, in fact, it's possible to achieve a, the sort of mind that sees fame and shame as being equally empty, right? Well, then one has to question just 
what this need for self-esteem is really about in the end. You know, if seeing yourself reviled on Twitter can be as meaningless as seeing yourself praised on Twitter, you know, then you, you've surmounted something there and it's not, you're no longer vulnerable to the vicissitudes by which most people would define their, their effort to secure self-esteem or being in good standing with a community, say. And I mean, there are even, you know, there are practices in the contemplative tradition that explicitly target these opposites for this purpose, right? Like if you're a great meditator who thinks he's transcended his concerns about self-esteem, well, then your teacher may recommend that you do something that you would normally find just absolutely mortifying just to see how you can inhabit that channel of human experience, right? So you deliberately embarrass yourself or engage some way of life that reduces your status so that people begin treating you differently and, and you begin to feel what that's like and play with that mode of human experience. I mean, many people have done even just school projects where you go out in a wheelchair, even though you're not, you don't need one, right? You just see what it's like to be in a wheelchair and have everyone think, you know, you are a paraplegic and treat you with all the weirdness that often evokes from people. There are many insights you can get from doing something like that. But the thing you begin to notice is just how vulnerable you normally are to the changes in affect and attitude and and assumption that can happen just based on some very simple social cues. So apart from that, I guess you know, we should talk about just how far this project of transcendence can likely go, because there is almost certainly false advertising here, born of thousands of years of quasi-religious philosophizing, unconstrained by science. But, you know, in my experience, the assumptions that most Westerners and most, you know, most people, it's not just Westerners at this point, make about the, the superficiality of the project of, you know, let's say, learning to meditate, you know, those assumptions can be proven false in a variety of ways. And it's just, it's interesting that that's kind of a, a limiting factor on how people think about transcendence and its prospects. Well, you said a lot of wise things there. I mean, I think it's really important to not treat these practices as panaceas, right? As quick fixes. Maslow called them quick hits of transcendence. He was very much against that. He thought self-actualization took a lot of work. And he actually was very, very wary of psychedelics. Did he take psychedelics? No, no, he didn't. That's interesting. I mean, he was surrounded by people who were the, both the, the major researchers and proponents of psychedelics at that time. So he must have just decided based on some, some reasons why not to. What, what were those reasons? I don't remember encountering that in your book. Yeah. He used to rib a lot with Timothy Leary. And there's a famous story of them walking together at Harvard Square and Maslow saying something like, you know, would you want to take an elevator to the top of Mount Everest? You know, and, you know, so he was like teasing him about LSDs being a shortcut and Maslow very much viewed it as a shortcut. And I read all these letters that, that he, he had wrote in personal correspondence to various people about his, his thoughts on LSD. But in the, during that, that same conversation, there was a time where I think they were exhausted from walking and Maslow said, should we get a taxi or something? And then Timothy Leary kind of made fun of him as well. He said, I thought you said you didn't want any shortcuts. Right. So anyway, that was funny, kind of joking back and forth. But yeah, Maslow really was trying to hold off on that because he really railed against these easy answers to self. He really viewed self-actualization as being committed to a calling or something deep within yourself that, that you love, that brings out the best in you, and that you are committed to working towards day in and day out. He hmm. very much was in that sort of meaning mode, similar to Viktor Frankl. And there's some fascinating discussions between Viktor Frankl and, and Maslow about meaning and their similarities and differences about their way of thinking about that. But he really railed against it. And, and he, he would kind of go back and forth, like in his, in his book on peak experiences in religion, he says something to the effect, well, I know psychedelics are becoming popular now, and this may scientifically someday show to have benefits. But he was very tentative about it. I, I think if he were alive today and he, he saw the science and saw a lot of the positive benefits, I should think he'd change his mind a little bit and would be, would be even, would be a bit more excited about it. Have you taken psychedelics? I haven't. 
I haven't. I'm like Maslow in that yeah. sense. So what's behind that? Well, I personally am have always been prone biologically, dispositionally to to hypomania, which is not the same as manic, you know, in, in sort of bipolar. Mm. There's actually, hypomania is a personality trait that we all vary on. It's correlated with schizotypy. And, uh, and, and this is actually what led into a whole rabbit hole of research I've been conducting on schizotypy and its relationship to creativity and how, in some sense, it can be related to schizophrenia. But I've been really interested in that paradox of when does it tip over to schizophrenia versus when does it tip over into creative thinking? Mm -hmm. So I've just noticed in myself that I, I've been prone to this kind of, you know, like I can see beauty somewhere and then just start crying, you know, mm -hmm. over it and without psychedelics. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of scared. I want, I want to do it with someone with, that's a good guide, you know, or someone who's really experienced with it. Cause I'm kind of scared of, of being high and then, or being kind of having this wonderful experience. And then can you have too much of, of this kind of transcendent experience where it becomes overwhelming? Can you tell yeah, me? Yeah. Oh yeah. We, you, you certainly can. And I think being, I don't know much about hypomania, but I can imagine just wanting to be cautious if you feel like there's something that, if you have a concern that you could be destabilized in some way that wouldn't be healthy. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, for instance, someone who has a greater than normal reason to worry that they might be prone to schizophrenia, that's a real, I say this without any clinical experience, but just from what I understand of the literature, that, that seems like a contraindication for mm. certainly psychedelic, you know, real psychedelics. So, you know, I would, I would leave MDMA aside, but LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, you know, DMT, I, th I think you would be wise to, uh, at the mm. very least, be cautious there if there's any kind of clinical risk in the offing. Yeah, I mean, the, for me, the utility of psychedelics, and I guess this does relate somewhat, you, you wrote an article on mindfulness that I also wanted to talk about, and it relates to your take on meditation there. There are many reasons to take psychedelics, but that for me, the most, the one that applies to, to most people, and I think the one that, that integrates most directly with this larger project of getting to Everest by the means of growth rather than the elevator that takes you up there and, and, and then you promptly die of exposure or hypoxia. It's that without having had certain experiences, you really have no sense of how limited your normal experience is. This is in terms of affect and cognition and the ethical implications of both. I mean, it's just you have no, you just don't know what, how confined the prison of your mind is, or even that it is a prison until you've, one of the walls has been broken down for you and you've seen some vast horizon that you didn't even imagine existed. Or, or even if you did, even if you paid lip service to the possibility, you just didn't know what it would be like to confront it. And I mean, I guess the analogy that works for me is to, I mean, to think of mental training and meditation as a species of that, somewhat analogous to physical training. And and you know, physical training is obviously something we, it's a thing, we, we know it's uncontroversial that you can get stronger and more flexible and improve your balance. And I mean, you can become an Olympic gymnast, right? And so everyone who begins working out does it in a context that they know that, that while they may not become an Olympic gymnast, they know just how far this can be taken. You know, when you're just struggling to touch your toes or do one pull up or one push up, because you've been sedentary for the last 10 years, you know that extraordinary transformations of the body are possible. And then the question is just how far are you going to take this? How dissatisfied are you going to be with your inability to do much of anything? And how inspired are you going to be by you know, watching the Olympics or you're know, seeing pictures of people who have completely transformed their bodies? And the problem with with the contemplative life and meditation and other tools is that the changes are for the most part invisible. It's not that they don't have emotional correlates and therefore behavioral ones. And, and that's why the rampages of various gurus seem to be disqualifying of the whole project. But for the most part, this is an, an inner landscape and, and therefore a hidden one. And therefore all we have is the testimony of people to say how far this landscape actually goes. And so you can't see 
the gold medal floor exercise at the Olympics to prove beyond any possibility of doubt that it is possible to take the project of becoming stronger and more flexible and getting greater balance and all that. I mean, you can take it to a, a level of perfection that you wouldn't otherwise be able to imagine, right? And so with psychedelics, it's a little bit like suddenly being dropped in to the gold medal routine of the floor exercise. Modulo a few ways this analogy breaks down. I mean, it's not that everything you can experience on psychedelics is normative or, you know, worth getting by some other route. I mean, you can experience things that are terrifying and, and clearly not normative. But if you, if you hit the sweet spot on LSD or psilocybin or, you know, MDMA, again, not, not a classic psychedelic, but it shows you a different room in, in the mansion of understanding. If you hit any of those sweet spots that do, in their, within their purview, seem normative, if you experience something like unconditional love on MDMA, or you experience self-transcending unity with nature, I'll say, on psilocybin, it is like, you know, experiencing physical perfection, you know, of a sort that, you know, only the most highly trained athlete would ever touch, and you're just dropped into it. And then you, then you lose it again, you come down, but you realize, okay, that's possible. Even though you can forget it on a you know, day by day basis, you have seen something that you, you know there's a there there. And then the question is, what are you going to do about it? And then, then meditation, if you take it up as a practice, can be practiced in the context of knowing that this is not a false project, right? Just knowing that it's when someone says they've had this kind of experience, you know from within that this is an actual potential of the human mind, you know, and th therefore the human brain, and there's no reason why it couldn't be a potential of yours given the right changes. So that's, the virtue is in, again, it's not the only virtue, but for me, the primary virtue is, is almost rhetorical. It's the only thing that would have convinced a skeptic like me that there was a path to go anywhere, really. You know, that's its utility. Again, there we could talk about other things that it does for people, but for me, it it is the the perfect rejoinder to the otherwise necessary skepticism, which is you know because again we're surrounded on all sides by bullshit, you know things that are clearly bullshit, and it's hard to find the diamond in the bag of glass. And yeah, psychedelics can help you distinguish the two. Yeah, there's a lot there, and I really enjoy listening to your experiences. I enjoy listening to other people's experiences. We often. We can intellectualize this stuff as much as we want, but until we actually experience it, we sometimes don't fully understand something to be the case. And I'm really impressed with the scientific research that's coming out on showing that psychedelics in combination with spiritual practices show the greatest mm -hmm. effects like meditation, but also prayer. There's some new studies, large scale studies that show that the combination is better than either alone. And so the more you can integrate those psychedelic experiences into the rest of your life, the more productive it'll be. But, you know, what's interesting to me, though, is that there's lots of different routes to this, this certain transcendent state of being. There's lots of different routes. I'm wondering, is psychedelics, is, is that, do, do you think there's nothing else practices that can take us to that same, to those same insights? What are your thoughts on that? It depends which insights and experiences you're talking about. I mean, it's really, it's a Venn diagram for me, which in certain cases barely overlaps between what is, you know, the real purpose of meditation or the kinds of experiences people can have in meditation and really the essence of it. I mean, the real utility of it and the, the kinds of experiences people can have on psychedelics. The way I distinguish them is that there's consciousness and its contents and Almost any attempt, you know, successful or otherwise, to change experience is a matter of changing the contents of consciousness. That is really the goal, and you know whether it's thought about in those terms or not, and that is the effect. And you know, by definition, all of these changes are temporary. You know, so you can have a peak experience through taking psychedelics. You can have a peak experience through you know going on a meditation retreat and meditating for. 14 hours a day for a month. And these kinds of experiences can be pretty similar. The difference with psychedelics is you're guaranteed to have a radical change in the contents of your consciousness 
and it's guaranteed to happen more or less within the hour, right? So it's like if someone gives you an effective dose of LSD or psilocybin, there's no question something's going to happen, right? Now, it may be a terrifying something, but if nothing else, it will prove to you that experience is a highly plastic thing, and it is possible to inhabit states of consciousness that you never dreamed were possible a mere hour ago. And again, you can get there with meditation, and you can get there in a much more orderly way without the downside. I mean, some people can go crazy on a meditation retreat as well. So you know, it's not that there's no risk, but it's not the same kind of spin of the roulette wheel where you're, you're really not sure what you're going to get until you get it. All your attempts to control set and setting, notwithstanding. So it is more orderly and it can go into very rarefied terrain. But the actual sweet spot for meditation, which is to say the transcendence that actually matters, is something that you can recognize about the nature of consciousness in any moment that's coincident with any contents. You don't actually need the pyrotechnics of the psychedelic experience or even the pyrotechnics of changes in state born of intense concentration and meditation to recognize this thing about the nature of consciousness. And, you know, this thing is referred to by many names, but it's cutting through the illusion of the self or recognizing emptiness or non-duality. I mean, there are many sort of facets by which you could talk about it, but it's the loss of this sense of subject-object perception. It's the, and this is completely coincident with ordinary perception. You can drive a car in this state of consciousness. This is a perfectly functional state because it's not actually a state. I mean, this is the way consciousness is when you're no longer constructing this sense of being the center of consciousness. To speak of it in representational terms, it's like you can represent the world without representing a subject in your head, in your body, in the world. Most people have this additional sense that there's a homunculus in the head that's doing the thinking and the feeling and the reacting. And that can be taken offline. And how that relates to neurophysiology or what the default mode network is doing, I mean, that's an open question. But, you know, based on the current literature, it seems like it's probably at least part of what the default mode network is doing, in addition to just producing mind wandering or daydreaming or just random thinking. There's a strain of thinking that is explicitly self-referential. And, and again, I don't know if this has actually been studied, but more than just self-referential thought, there's the, the difference between noticing thought as an appearance in consciousness among all the other appearances and being identified with thought, which is to say thinking without knowing that you're thinking. And that's the subtlest entanglement with thought, which does give this feeling of subject in the head, being the thinker. And so meditation can break that spell. And breaking that identification leaves everything else untouched. Now, it is, in fact, true that the more you do that, and the longer those moments of true non-duality or perception of emptiness last, then that does begin to change the character of the contents of consciousness as well, right? So that can begin to you know, seem more rarefied and more psychedelic and more dreamlike. That's where some of that explicitly mystical language can come into even this sort of discussion. But it's never the point, and it's never the thing you're trying to maximize. And in fact, when you begin to practice in this non-dual way, it's explicitly part of the instruction that you're, you need to break your attachment to any of those changes in consciousness that you think are a sign of something good happening. I mean, this is where the being mode versus the becoming mode or the being mode versus the deficiency, the deficiency mode, you know, which isn't your terminology. That's where that emphasis as a matter of practice becomes the entire game, right? Which is if being is really the point, if you've recognized something about the nature of consciousness, that cannot be improved. It neither admits of being improved or suggests that there's any need to improve it. And it's compatible with anything else that can be noticed as the contents of consciousness. It's compatible with noticing physical pain or an ugly thought or anything that might arise. 
well, then it's at that point, it's not a matter of changing anything. It's a matter of continuing to notice this quality of consciousness, which is its centerlessness, its openness, its clarity. Its, and then anything that changes, I mean, the feeling of you know, joy or the feeling of bliss, I mean, anything that becomes, for most people, certainly in the beginning of meditation, a sign that meditation is actually working, all of that gets disavowed as an appearance in a dream that is meaningless. It has no meaning at that point. The fact that you suddenly feel good, that's not the point of meditation. And in that sense, most of what people experience with psychedelics, just the experience of being bowled over by incredibly intense and you know often very positive experience, right? Bliss and seeing colors of a sort, you know, colors in the natural world that you never imagined possible, and a feeling that the energy of your body is inseparable from the energy of the world and you know the energetics of all of that whatever the knob is in the brain that you know somewhere near the nucleus accumbens that you can grab and turn up to 11 well then it it got turned up to 12 there and none of that is ultimately the point right none of that can be the point and yet it again it's the thing that if you've never experienced it you know you're someone who just can't imagine how different a human experience can be and that lack of imagination becomes the reason why you are satisfied with Netflix and not hating your life. You get up each day and merely repeat that project. I, I don't know if that answered your question, but it gets somewhat paradoxical in, in terms of trying to equate what the project is from the point of view of meditation and the utility of psychedelics. Yeah, it, it was really elucidating. I really appreciated that. I'm trying to square that away from way with something you said earlier about you kind of were pushing back against trans when i said transcenders they live for peak experiences you were kind of doubtful or criticizing that's a that's a worthy project you noted how peak experiences were so ephemeral mm. and yet now you're talking about you're advocating for these kind of lsd type experiences that are ephemeral only insofar as they can get you to be sufficiently interested in something deeper than what you're tending to experience by the happenstance of your own conditioning, right? So like we've all been conditioned by culture to think certain things are possible and to hope for certain outcomes in our lives. And we're continually having various states of consciousness advertised to us as desirable and take the hull of the boat that we're, we're trying to shore up. You know, we you know, we, we all have various self-esteem needs, say, and needs for belonging and, and connection. And then the fulfillment of those needs get advertised to us and modulated by culture. So like, what does self-esteem mean now? Well, it means something different than in, you know, the 1980s before anyone had even heard of social media, you know, or imagined that such a thing was possible. Now it means something online and we're all trying to navigate the consequences of that. So I would say that the role of a, a peak experience, which again, by definition, is going to come and go, like every experience, is, is to convince you that there's, that there's more to the landscape of mind than you may have assumed, and which you're tacitly assuming by prioritizing the way you're, you're spending your time and attention in the way that you are, right? I mean, like if you might not think that you, you have, you know, bounded the horizon of your aspirations so narrowly. But if you're spending more or less every moment of your life just trying to come out on the winning side of a skirmish on Twitter and eke out a few more publications and earn fifty percent more money than you did last year, right? Like if that is taking up ninety percent of a person's bandwidth, well, you know, embedded in that use of energy and attention are certain assumptions about what will be ultimately satisfying. And, you know, it's a very common experience to arrive at the fulfillment of all of that. You know, you make a little more money, you publish a little more, your snark lands appropriately on Twitter to the jubilation of your growing fan base. And yet, on some level, the, the itch you were trying to scratch doesn't get finely and, and fully scratched. And you're just you're still on the treadmill, and so then you begin to wonder, you know, what more there might be to experience in a human life. And the thing with with a peak experience, whether it's 
one through psychedelics or by some other means, is that it does prove that it's possible to fall into the the well of being or somewhere close to it to a degree that nullifies almost any other concern you might have, right? And even a concern about death in the end. And that's there's something really both emotionally cleansing about that and also just what can enable someone to correct course if they see its implications. That one in particular I'm fascinated with the extent to which transcendent experiences, not just psychedelic through the use of psychedelics, but through a lot of other spiritual practices can help us reduce our fear of death. You know, there's a twist ending to my book, and it's not all about the peak experiences. What Maslow realized towards the end of his life is that really life is about the plateau experiences. Yeah. And that's not a phrase that's used often when people talk about Maslow, they may talk about peak experiences, but his great insight, perhaps his greatest insight, was the just the past couple years of his life when he was facing his own mortality. And he was confused because according to his hierarchy of needs model, if he goes you know, down to the bottom of the hierarchy all of a sudden and has these concerns about, about safety, well, that should block self-actualization and block feelings of transcendence. But he wrote in his, in his personal diaries, how can it be that this experience is giving me a greater appreciation of my life and I'm feeling these transcendent experiences more than I ever have in my entire life. And, and, and it took me facing this mortality to get there. Mm. So that was confusing to him. That was, a par that was very paradoxical to him. It kind of threw out of whack his whole hierarchy <laughs> in a sense. And in my book, I try to reconcile that paradox. That's one of the most fundamental paradoxes I try to reconcile because there's one literature in psychology showing that when you face mortality salience on a daily basis, like you live in impoverished neighborhoods or you live in any, you know, you grow up with a lot of discord or chaos in your environment. You don't experience a lot of trans, these kinds of transcendent peak experiences. You're, you're, you are focused on most immediate concerns. You tend to, Daniel Nettle and other evolutionary psychologists have shown you focus on, on mating. You focus on a food acquisition status. I mean, you focus on the things that you, you need for survival and reproduction. But, it seems like if you can transcend living in that constant state of, of chaos and you face mortality, then there's a group of people in the psychological literature that report their fear of death is gone. They um, report a really new, newfound sense of meaning in life, new projects they want to take on, new creative aspects. And the way I reconcile this is so much of that literature on mortality salience doesn't take doesn't look at individual differences in deprivation of needs. So I think there is a great value in in transcending your your need for your basic needs. So transcending your incessant need for esteem, self esteem, transcending your incessant mm. need for connection with only the people that you feel connection to, as opposed to a connection to all of humanity. You can transcend, and, and this is a big one because obviously some people don't have a choice in the matter if they're born in certain neighborhoods or environments where there's a lot of violence and chaos in their environment. It's, you know, better, it's easier said than done to just transcend it. But if you can transcend it so that these basic needs are not, you're not preoccupied with them anymore. The research I've seen shows that, that mortality salience under that state of consciousness actually gives you the heightened most heightened states of transcendence that a person could possibly have. So this was a big sort of paradox I was trying to reconcile with these two dueling literatures. You know, on the one hand, mortality salience leading to momentary concerns of survival and reproduction. And then this other literature in positive psychology showing that mortality salience can lead to greater meaning and post-traumatic growth. I guess almost everything we're talking about is susceptible to this dual, you know, it's almost a pre-trans distinction that Ken Wilber made. I have not found a lot of use for Ken Wilber in my thinking about these things, but perhaps we could go there if you're a student of his. But he famously gave us this pre-trans fallacy, which is the, the pre-rational can sound a lot like the trans-rational. And this is sort of contextualizes Freud's dismissal of mystical experience as the oceanic feeling. Is This is the return to childhood, a return to infancy. This is the pre-rational mind 
you know, wallowing in its own energies. And Ken Wilber, I think, quite usefully pointed out that it can sound like that, but the transcendence of separation that one can experience after one has the full toolkit of rationality on board is not the same thing as a return to infancy. It's the trans-rational, so it's hence the pre-trans fallacy. But yeah, many of these points, like when you think about this is somewhere near the hull of the, the boat, the feeling of like a self-efficacy, that you can do things well and that you can master various challenges and you know you're the antithesis of the the learned helplessness that coincides with a kind of depression. You want that, but if you keep going in that healthy direction, you also recognize that you basically don't control anything. Ultimately, I can't, it's a mystery as to whether or not I'm going to get to the end of this sentence in grammatically complete form, right? And when I make a mistake, I didn't control that. When I do it successfully, I didn't control that. You know, this is, I, I, on some level, I'm a witness to this performance. And so it is with all of life. Anything can happen at any moment. We're hanging out over the precipice every moment. I mean, just as a matter of physical health, when are you going to have a stroke or a heart attack? Who the hell knows, right? This is just a probability distribution over each moment that you have to learn to live with. And yeah, it's this pandemic has taught many of us that history can swallow up a society with nothing more than a, a microbe born of a sneeze or cough, you know, on a moment's notice. And we're still trying to dig out from the implications of all this with the understanding that it could have been 10 times worse and, and may yet be 10 times worse the next time around. So it's the sense that we really can control anything is an illusion. And yet at one level, and that's not to nullify the difference between feeling self-efficacy in the midst of one's various projects and feeling like one can't do anything worth doing. I mean, that's still an enormous difference. You know, I don't know if I've resolved that paradox, but it's, I think it's the degree of focus, the kind of the wide angle or the, the microscopic focus. Each can be useful by turns. And the microscopic focus reveals that control is, is imaginary. The, the wide angle is there's orderly behavior and getting what one wants out of life and all the failures to do that. And those are different. Yeah, at the heart of a lot of what you're saying, and you're saying a lot of really good stuff, at the heart of a lot of it is the fear of uncertainty. This is, this is just cuts through it all. You can live your life with a fear of uncertainty and the, and the greater, and in sort of a linear way, the greater the fear, the more we go into this state. Psychologists have identified psychological entropy, where we, at the ultimate extreme, we, we just can't cope and we get depression. We feel helpless, as you mentioned. Or you can live in a constant state of exploration. And exploration means that you are actively exploring the unknown. It, the unknown excites you. The, the unknown entices you. The more you can master and challenge the unknown, the happier you are mm. in your life. So I think that we're constantly, to be human is to be constantly pulled in one way or another. I'm a big fan of, of, of not acting as though anyone's above anyone else and some they, they've reached some high estate that they're no longer human to me to become fully human is recognizing that you have these tendencies within you and you have to constantly choose the exploration option and and learn how to manage the uncertainty that's inevitable in your lives you you're right you're so right in the sense that this moment puts a lot of things in context for people you know, it's funny, to, not funny, it's, it's tragic, but you hear people talking about as though it just dawned on them for the first time in their lives that there's uncertainty in their lives. You know, for some people, maybe this is the first time they've, they've really thought about that, you know, but you, you could remind them of all the many other things that they've had throughout their lives before this moment that were incredibly uncertain and could have led to a lot of danger and people still made decisions and people still did certain things. This is kind of like, because it's on the news, you know, we're all so focused on this being the great uncertainty when we could create a news program with 40 million other forms of uncertainty that you have during the course of your day. I, you know, I say, I bet you didn't know about this could happen to you today too, you know? So I think just the heart of a lot of what you're saying is living a life of, are you really going to live that life with a spirit of 
exploration and openness to new experiences and curiosity for the unknown, or are you committed to to fearing it and and having that illusion of control? Because obviously, you know, and, and Alan Watts wrote so beautifully about this. We the only certainty is that there's uncertainty. Yeah, I mean, more and more, I'm becoming interested in the way in which a person's individual experience, you know, positive or negative, is an unreliable guide to what it takes to make the world a better place. The thing many of us have noticed is that people are kind of reliably horrified or, you know, most exercised by things that are not, not really the gravest concerns or the gravest injustices or the, the worst outcomes that are on offer in this world. And also, people are gratified by things that are not actually the best outcomes, which is to say our, our feeling states are loosely coupled at best to the, the hardware that should be guiding our priorities collectively as a culture, as a society. You notice this in the moral domain where people's feeling of altruism and their actual philanthropic impulses, which is to say the size of the check they will write to a cause, is you know successfully gamed by the single anecdote or the single persuasive narrative that focuses on one vulnerable little person. And it's reliably diminished by statistics attesting to the enormity of a, of a problem, right? So you tell people that, you know, 400,000 people are, are dying from X. They care much less about X than when you tell them about one little girl dying from X. They even care less about that little girl if you add the, the information of the 400,000, right? Oh, yeah. And this is based on Paul Slovak's work. And so this is clearly just a moral error that, you know, our, our emotional hardware is just not up to the task of thinking or, you know, much less responding to the misery of legions of people. And, you know, I think this affects us in many, many other ways. And we, therefore, we have to have ways of correcting for the, the way in which our feeling doesn't map on to the data of the world in a way that, that allows us to, to solve our biggest problems. There was a, a line near the end of your book from Maslow that caught my attention where he he was thinking about how good of a society human nature permits and how good of a human nature society permits. Yeah. Just the, the integration between the, the individual and society. And I'm wondering how you think about that dynamic, even in, in light of our current circumstance, because many of us are now thinking about how society itself can reboot over the next six months to a year, you know, as we figure out a, an adequate response to the health crisis and the and the economic crisis i mean many many things seem to be at least on the table to be rethought whether we'll will effectively do that or not and yeah so the big picture questions are on the top of, of many people's minds at the moment what a wonderful question sam you know you're seeing right now you're seeing first of all you have to recognize human nature is not a monolith thing there are different aspects of our nature and you're seeing individual differences right now. You're seeing some people who are reacting to the situation with, they feel like their freedom is being encroached, right? They feel like this is, that's what they're focusing on, that aspect of their nature. Um, there are others that are, that are taking more of a social connectedness, uh, prevent people from harm. Uh, we need to really focus on taking care of our, our fellow individuals and and I'm willing to make a huge sacrifice of freedom in order, personal freedom in order to do that. I think that in a lot of ways, this moment might make us better people. I could see the argument for that, where we start to shift our, our priorities towards what really matters to us and, and gives us a time of reflection and deep contemplation on what we've been doing in our past, you know, this might be a reset of our human nature. I mean, you talked about a reset or a pause of society. This also might be a reset of human nature in, in a way. I'm curious to see where this, what the end game here is here, how this, how this plays out, because you, you, you are clearly seeing this faction of, of, of people that are focusing on the freedom need versus 
those that are focusing on a on a different aspect of 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 their nature and so you can see this ma being magnified into factions of which aspects of our nature are we bringing out but even transcending that i think this moment might really make what, us what, what do you mean yeah. by that what 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 do you mean by a reset of human nature i mean but to most people's ear i think human nature is the, precisely the kind of thing yeah. that couldn't be reset barring some genetic engineering done writ large on all of us or you know again you know pharmacology overriding human nature or cultural changes that are so extreme that you know human nature is tamped down to the point of you know not being not allowed to express itself well i'm wondering if this is going to bring us and is it bringing us together like nothing else in the universal love sort of sense where we realize we're all in this together or is it pulling us apart like nothing else mm. politically i think a case could be made that that both are happening simultaneously and it, it's fascinating to see who, what's going to win <laughs> you know like at, at the most extreme as this continues we have no idea when there's going to be a vaccine or is it bringing out the the most important essential aspects of the political divide or is it bringing us together and making us realize that a lot of our petty concerns, things that were petty before, things we would yell at people on Twitter about before, it just seems stupid now to yell about some of those things with other people when we're going through this sort of thing. So I'm wondering which aspect of our nature is going to kind of win out here. I think that there could be, in an optimistic version, a reset of our human nature that brings us together and, and, you, and, and Twitter dialogue and, and, and lots of things that were considered the biggest issue, you know, a lot of, there, there were issues that were discussed on Twitter I saw just six months ago, nonstop in my circles, where I don't even see those discussions anymore. It almost seems silly to be yelling over it. Some things just seem so petty now. And I wonder if this is a large scale experiment on what happens to individuals when they face mortality salience. I mean, we just talked about this at the individual level. And I wonder if, I wonder if this is an interesting experiment to see how this might play out on a more societal level. Yeah, there's one thing that I think needs to be reset ultimately, you know, the pandemic aside, I mean, we're on a collision course with this set of norms. This doesn't really go all the way down to the bedrock of human nature, but it is pretty close to bedrock in terms of people's ethical and political assumptions, certainly in any capitalistic society and it seems especially in america and it, and it's this issue around work and it, the necessity of, of work as a way of securing one's place in the world securing one's right to exist and yeah you know so when you think of something like universal basic income which some version of which we need right now which we're in fact doling out right now and then the question is whether just how much of that's going to happen and how long it will continue for. But, you know, many of us have been talking about this for now some years, that when you extrapolate the consequences of automation and artificial intelligence, you know, in the, the set of good outcomes, right? Forget about the dystopian ones, but the good outcomes entail an ability to produce wealth of a sort that really has never been imagined before. And commensurate with that, the cancellation of the need for many forms of human labor i mean it, it, more or less all human drudgery but even you know much labor that is considered very creative you know high cognitive value work right so yeah. it might be that we'll you know we'll build artificial intelligence that does a lot of our science for us and all of our software engineering for us and then the question is, you know, what are humans good for when the machines do all of or most of the necessary work? Clearly, the current ethic, which again is, it seems to be more or less in everyone's source code in America, that assumes that you have to find something to do in the world that other people want to pay you for. Otherwise, you really have no claim on existence. That's what adulthood requires. That doesn't make any sense in a world of functionally infinite abundance, right? And because you shouldn't have to do anything that someone is going to pay you for if money is falling out of the sky. 
And so then the question is, what is human life for at that point? Now, most people are not inclined to imagine us ever getting there. I mean, it sounds like utopia, but it's a failure to imagine that end game, which is really uh, it's the only, only one I can imagine when, when you imagine everything succeeding you know, technologically for us. That failure is keeping people from seeing how we can most effectively respond to this crisis, right? I mean, people you know, are worried if we give out too much money, people won't be incentivized to work. And people think that, you know, even rich people, you know, billionaires, if you tax them too much, they'll stop doing their billionaire thing that, that is so productive, right? You know, Jeff Bezos won't get up every day and, and work to grow Amazon as effectively if he was only worth $40 billion as opposed that's, to 140 billion, true. right? And there's just that's no true. reason to think that. And so many wealthy people are doing the thing they would, they would do anyway, even if they didn't have to do anything for money, because most of them don't have to do anything for money at this point. It's just a failure to see this possibility. Anyway, so I just so love that to you. Yeah, it's exactly right. And when Maslow was talking about the, his vision of the good society, and then I tried to take a shot at my own vision of the good society based on research and all this, you know, I think so much of it's changing the reward structures of society. These reward structures start really, really young. They start in elementary school when we say, well, grades, that's, the, that's, that's our worth. You know, that's, that's, that's what the value of human life is, is to get an A. So we can show our mom that, look, I got an A. Then it's getting into a good college. And that's, oh, that's, our, that's the reward structure. And then, and then we, so we can get a high paying job. But if we can change our reward structure, so as Maslow put it, virtue pays. And I think it's a very simple phrase, but I think it actually can be quite profound. Imagine a society where virtue pays, where people who are intrinsically motivated to do what they're doing and are, and are contributing to the good society, that goodness is rewarded. And, and, not the, and it's not about the money. It's not about these external aspects that tell us what our meaning is. It's more of us getting a chance to find what the meaning is for ourselves and being rewarded for finding our own source of meaning that contributes to the world. I think that it's a different, very different way of structuring society. So much that I think it really comes down to the messages we're given at the earliest ages about what matters the most. And it starts in school, and, and I, um, that's a whole other rabbit hole. I, you probably don't have the time, we don't have the time to go down, but my work in education and uh, reimagining education and, and, and what that could look like. Mm. Well, maybe we can just touch that briefly, because in the midst of this crisis, Many people are wondering how education could change in the future. I mean, just obviously yeah, the remote right. aspect of it now is is most salient to people. But something has broken here in terms of the sense that the status quo will be reachieved. I mean, if we got a vaccine tomorrow, I think many people will still be left wondering what is the point of going into hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt so that I can physically be on an Ivy-laden uh, campus when really on some level it's about getting certain information into my head? And what is actually the point of going to a good school? Is it really nothing more than signaling to future employers that I was the sort of person who could get into a good school without any assurance that I'm the sort of person who retains any useful knowledge at the moment. What if I came by that knowledge by some other route? I mean, the spell has started to break in certain fields, like in, in Silicon Valley, where people are just concerned that someone can actually program as opposed to you know where they got their degree or if they got a degree. But I'm just wondering how you think there could be a reset in education. Whew. I hope there's a reset. It needs to be a reset. I teach a course at Columbia called The Science of Living Well. and I actually recommend they listen to your Waking Up app, but among other uh, oh, nice. meditation kind of apps. But I, I intentionally created this course because I wanted to change the incentive structures of, of a class and what the point is. You know, what, you're right. So mo most of these students have been living on autopilot thinking, oh, the point is to get a good GPA so that I have a good resume to get into a good, 
it's always about the future. It's always about some distant future. It's always about some objective metric that everyone can agree on as now you, you're worth it, now you're worthy. In this course I teach, I, I have growth as the metric and that's it. So there isn't comparison from one person to another. It's, I have a whole series of growth challenges throughout the semester. Maybe it could be confronting and embracing your dark side and, and really becoming friends with it. That could be one growth challenge. Another growth challenge is increasing the high quality connections in your life or being more mindful of, of things around you and having more gratitude in your life. And you start to add up all these things and students start to realize that that's life. Like, like those are, like those are the things, there's, there's, no, there's actually nothing more to life. Hmm. That's it. And, and, and I, if I could just circle back, cause I didn't fully describe what the plateau experience is. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I kind of dropped the term and I, you can't expect anyone, you know, I, I didn't even know what it meant before I started reading, reading Maslow's writings, but really the plateau experience is the, that's the most profound transcendent moments of your lives where you can find the miraculous in the everyday. Right. That's, that's life. If you can cultivate that skill, that'll be a far greater skill than constantly beating yourself up over not getting, you know, this grade or that grade or this amount of money or look at that other person's getting that amount of money and, you know, it really becomes a zero sum relative game. If you can move towards growth in your, in your momentary experiences in your lives and in your life and, and really realize that everything around you already is pretty miraculous, like right now. That's a fundamentally different way of being and living. And it's, it's been such a privilege for me to teach these students and to watch their own journeys. And, you know, they write cards at the end of the semester and stuff like that. Hmm. And, and, and it really touches you because you realize that the insight of a lot of these students are getting is, is that there's, there's, you may think that like there ever will be a point in your life where you get there and then you've accomplished something or you've reached self-actualization actualization, or you've reached transcendence. But it's all just a process. It's all just the your interaction between your, the relational interaction between the experience of you and the world, and and that happens in a momentary, momentary basis. And there are just so many things we can do right now uh, without waiting, without waiting for that paycheck or waiting for the next job that can give us meaning and infuse and breathe deep meaning into our lives. Because I think a lot of what you're asking is it's such a profound question, and and you know, how are people going to find meaning if they're not getting paid for it? It, it? There's a level of thinking where that question doesn't even make sense anymore, right? Yeah. Given the right technological changes, it quite literally won't make any sense. Yeah. You know, it's not to say that we're, we'll ever perfectly achieve this, but something like this is achievable. I mean, there's just there's just no guarantee that humans will be the best source of any specific form of labor in the limit of technological progress. And if we could just be handed that progress tomorrow, you know, if God could just hand us the perfect labor-saving device that could do any work human beings are inclined to do, but better, you know, it plays chess better uh, as your phone already does, it calculates better as your phone already does, and it does everything else better. Well, then in our current environment, that would precipitate a political and economic cataclysm. We don't have the politics and the economics that could assimilate that kind of wealth creation because it, you know, it would currently accrue to the team at Google that had the breakthrough that gave us this technology. And then, you know, they would all be trillionaires and we would be watching the wave of unemployment spread through society from their bunkers. And we need a new ethic by which we would see the necessity of spreading that wealth around quickly enough so that everyone would benefit. And again, not to say we're going to hit the asymptote there, but if we play our cards right, things will get better and better in that direction. So clearly the burden is on us to figure out how to spread the wealth around and to reconceive of what it means to be a productive member of society and how people get the self-esteem needs and the and the belonging needs and the connection needs met in a context of those new norms right where so when someone says oh so what are you doing with your life now the the self-esteem module in the 
in the average, you know, Ivy League brain, you know, it returns the string. Oh, I'm I'm a, a junior at Harvard, and that's that's answer enough. That's the perfect answer. And then a few years later, it'll be, you know, I just got a job at Goldman Sachs or whatever at Google, and that's the perfect answer. But at a certain point, that answer is isn't enough, and people can recognize it isn't enough even now when they when they take a an inventory of their moment to moment experience. I mean, which is to say that you know you can be at Harvard or at Google and still be you know suicidally depressed if you're unlike you know, unlucky enough to have that brain. So the question is where to locate human well being individually and culturally in the presence of sufficient technological and societal change. So I think a big part of it is recognizing that some things have intrinsic rewards in life. And those are the things that are actually most valuable to people. We don't often realize that with ourselves until we fight and for some promotion our whole life. And then mm. we get tenure and then we say, we're like, why, why am I not intrinsically happy about this? You know, like, why, why do I feel no, di no differently? You know, so, so things like ki well, kindness, let's take kindness for a second. Kindness is an intrinsic reward. I mean, we know in all the positive psychology interventions, just doing an act of helping someone else brings an intrinsic reward and, and people would rather have that feeling of intrinsic reward than not helping someone and getting money for it, mm. you know? So, although this is, this, so, this is know. interesting that, um, this, this connects back with something we were talking about before, which is, you know, I, I referred to, I think, is the, the disjunction between what feels good and what really is good or is doing the most good. And there is a consequential disjunction here where it's like you take kindness, right? It's like there are certain acts of kindness and philanthropy that feel as good as they can possibly feel. The intrinsicality of the reward is as salient as possible. And you get those good feels and it's exactly what you would hope philanthropy would be, right? And yeah. again, but that does tend to land us on the into the Paul Slovic paradox of being motivated by the things that should motivate us least. And it opens us to a paradox of the, you know, like you take someone like Bill Gates, who honestly, I don't know how rewarding his life is at this moment psychologically. I mean, I, I would hope it would be very rewarding, but I don't know what it's like to be Bill on a, daily or hourly basis, and he might not be feeling anything like the states of consciousness that Mother Teresa might have been feeling when she's working with the, you know, as she said, at the poorest of the poor in Calcutta. But there's a very good argument to be made that Bill Gates is doing more good at this point, just based on his largely telescopic philanthropy of you know, just signing checks, that he's doing more good than any person in human history. And there's there's a fairly compelling case to say that Mother Teresa did a lot of harm, right? I mean, she yeah. was certainly a religious dogmatist and ignoramus of a sort that couldn't help but do some considerable harm based on her crazy beliefs about the way in which suffering was purifying the souls she was tending to, right? And so, which is to say, she disavowed some very sane medical practices and straightforward ways of helping people in favor of creating a kind of charitable purgatory for the people under her care. So there is this weird disjunction between doing good as effectively as possible and finding that to be as rewarding as possible. And I, th I think one thing we need to figure out how to do is to couple those together better. And I, th I do think that is the work somehow of culture to get us to kind of reformulate our psychology. Okay. So you, you brought up an a terrific point and a, and a great distinction. So that's why and I'm sure you're familiar with the whole effective altruism movement. Yeah, yeah, that and that is, is they've really been influential on me of late. Yeah, me, me too, actually. I was very skeptical of it. I had a recent chat with Jeffrey Miller for my podcast and he kind of convinced me of it. So this is really interesting because I, I just published a paper, I think it just came out a week ago on pathological altruism. And mm. I created a scale to measure pathological altruism. There are a lot of people who, have a compulsive need to help others so that they feel good about it, but they're not actually really helping others. And they can actually cause a lot of damage through their compulsive need to feel good about helping others. And I wanted to create a scale to measure that and capture that. And I found that 
pathological altruism altruism was correlated with depression and it was correlated with narcissism vulnerable mm. particular type of narcissism called vulnerable narcissism that isn't discussed that often because people tr focus on the grandiose chest thumping narcissist but there's actually um, a form of narcissism called vulnerable narcissism where people need to be needed and mm. for their own ego so i wanted to sh to distinguish between genuine pro social motives and selfish pro social motives and we were able to do that in our paper and was even able to create another scale called healthy selfishness to show that actually people who say that they take good self care that they have good boundaries they know when to say no they actually have more genuine pro social motives so I, this whole paper was about the paradoxical nature of selfishness and how sometimes things that seem selfish can actually be very positive for self and others and some things that seem altruistic can be very paradoxically selfish. So I think this relates a lot to what you're saying and it's a really good distinction. The ideal, the ideal here, and so I'm going to clarify what I said earlier, is not just to have the intrinsic reward of helping others, but for that helping to have made a genuine positive impact on the people that you wanted to help. And, and when the two come together, the, it is a beautiful thing. You know, you can, the people who score high on, on our pathological altruism scale, this is the interesting paradox. They don't feel good. They mm -hmm. feel compulsive. Mm -hmm. um, they, it's never enough. Helping others is never enough. They have to, you know, they never enjoy it at any one moment. It's always on to who's the next person. It's like, a, there are people who are addicted to altruism for, mm. of the feeling of that feeling and that's what i wanted to capture in our scale and i can send you that paper if you're interested in reading it yeah yeah um, i'd love to read it yeah. Th yeah i think there was a book by that title i forgot the woman's name who was focusing yeah, on this. absolutely barbara oakley yeah uh, barbara edited yeah. a wonderful and i uh i reached out to her and i said do you think that it'd be worth you know trying to do a scientific study because a lot uh to create a scale on that so she's been really supportive of this project she's a, actually a pioneer in that field for sure yeah yeah, that's great. There was the, I forgot his name, but there was a man, I believe he was profiled in the New Yorker at one point, but the compulsive donator of his, of his organs, right? Oh, there, there was a guy who, I mean, he donated one kidney and I think he donated, you know, to a stranger and then he donated something else. He was somebody who was desperate to donate the maximum amount of his body he could, it seemed. And this was, I think Barbara writes about him, but he's, he's one of, um, he's an example of, of this link between depression and pathological altruism. That's a, that's a great example. And yeah, Barbara uses a lot of other good examples. I think like eugenics, there was good intentions around some of initial things by the center. Anyway, there's, there's some examples. I'm, I'm blanking on the exact mm -hmm. example, but a lot, some of the, you know, obvious, obviously our, our best intentions can go deeply, deeply awry. But when those intentions are selfishly motivated and we're not honest with ourselves about that, it's actually likely to go wrong. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, there, I mean, there's something to square here with, again, I, I do view it as a kind of salience problem because we're so, for reasons that are not yet understood but are, are fairly demonstrable, we are, we respond to stories in a way that we don't respond to data we seem disempowered by the magnitude of a problem and disconnected from it. So it's like if, if it's a choice to help one identifiable person, well, of course we want to do that. But if it's a choice to help millions, well, then how, you know we throw up our hands. How could our effort even make a difference? And even if it's the one identifiable person among the millions, we do sort of begin to say, well, what's the point of helping just one when I can't help all those others? And so the, it's like there are bugs in the system that we, that we have to figure out how to correct for. And I mean, I hope we can figure out a way to actually find the most troubling things, the most disturbing, and the most beneficial things, the most rewarding, you know, that we can continue to improve the fidelity of our feeling in its fit to the actual ethical landscape. I don't really have any ideas about how to do that apart from noticing the looseness of fit and struggling to tell better stories. But um, it does seem to me to be a, an enormous problem because, again, it's totally possible that you could have someone like Bill Gates, I mean, someone doing that amount of good, who 
is unhappy and unrewarded by it. Just because it's, you know, signing a check is not enough of an experience or, you know, the feedback isn't, doesn't drive the good feels in the way that the single compelling instance of kindness, you know, when you've brought over, you know, freshly baked cookies to your neighbor's house and seen their reaction, that might be the thing you remember as the real instance of kindness, despite the fact that you just opened 17 different laboratories that are producing vaccines that may yet restart civilization or whatever it is. We have to figure out how to fit ourselves to the ethical imperatives better. And I, again, I don't know if you have any ideas on that front. Well, I, I should, I'd get a huge award if I, if I had a great insight on that. It's, just, it's, it's the question that maybe runs through so much of what we're talking about today. The most beneficial things being the most re are rewarding. The fascinating thing about that topic is that we often spend so much of our lives searching for the things that we think will satisfy those actually most rewarding things. And, and we, we waste so much of our lives until we realize that we've wasted so much of our lives search, uh, don't going through the wrong path. So I'll give a concrete example I, I show in my book. What people really want is the need for connection. They really want a mutual relationship where you feel like you can depend on someone, someone cares about you, and you care about that person. But it's amazing how the roots people will go when that's what they really want. They'll go through the roots of the self-esteem route. They'll go through the root of belonging. That's so I make a distinction in my book between the need for belonging and the need for intimacy. It's not a distinction that's made often in the psychological literature, but I think it's like really important to point out that you can have your need for belonging met. You can join this group, this extremist uh, violent organization, or, I mean, they're, they're all searching for transcendence. They're all searching for belonging in some way, but they're really searching for is intimacy. What they really want, what they, the only thing, the only thing that will really, really satisfy them is the one thing that they're avoiding their, ent their entire lives. That might be the, the devil's trick that has been built into our human nature is that we often waste so much of our lives going down the wrong path mm. to get what we actually really want, which are, is usually much more, much simpler. It's usually this plateau experience path, but we search for lots of other things, thinking that it'll, it'll satisfy it. I have this example of Fry, who is the really famous comedian, I believe. And Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry. And yeah, he yeah, he's been a on the podcast. Yeah. A wonderful, he wrote a really, I don't, know, I don't know if you talked about this in your podcast, but he had this poignant, he, you know, he was suicidal. Yeah, and he he yeah. asked us. He asked himself this question. He said, "How can I be? How can I possibly be suicidal? I have more friends, more people who will I can call up at any time, and they'll be there for me. I have more followers. I have this that. How? Why am I profoundly lonely?" And he asked himself, "Why am I profoundly lonely?" And I try to answer that in in that chapter and talk about how there's no substitute for for mutual connection, not esteem, not belonging, not the million other things we do in our lives. Mm. I realize I realize I didn't actually touch your article on mindfulness and and your experience there. So maybe we can just we can close with that. What was your experience with meditation? How did you get into it? And maybe you can summarize that. So I started with skepticism over it. Quite frankly, I really and the, this is the reason why I was skeptical of it because I came from the daydreaming, the science of daydreaming tradition. That's what I studied in. Mm. In uh, grad school, one of my mentors, my biggest mentors, was Jerome Singer, the father of daydreaming. So he was one of the first ones in the 1960s. I think he might have been the first one. He wrote the book called Daydreaming to argue that in psychology, all this research has shown it's actually not what Freud, you know, well, Freud had thought everything was a neuroses, but it wasn't this horrible, you know, thing that we all thought. So I really worked with him to show the positive aspects of mind wandering and daydreaming and and so I was skeptical of, of the mindfulness movement, the return to breath, particularly mm. as, well, you know, that's almost antithetical to my mission of showing there's a lot of positive benefits of letting your mind wander. So I took a course with Michael Beam, an eight-week MBSR course at Penn. Yeah, and that's, that's mindfulness-based stress reduction pioneered by John Kabat-Zinn, just for people who don't exactly. know that. Yeah. And it really was transformative. I wrote this Scientific American post about this where you can, I don't know if you saw the before and after pictures. Could you notice the yeah. difference in me? Yeah, yeah. All? One was sort of the, the ironic meditation and yeah. the other was, was in earnest. Yeah. 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 And 
it it really is helpful. I was feeling a lot of anxiety around that time. Uh, my doctors were like, should we just give you an SSRI? And I said, you know what, let me take this eight-week course. And then let's, and I, and I didn't, didn't find the need for the SSRI after the eight-week course. I mean, that's how powerful that was for me. And I think that it also helped me reconcile that paradox between daydreaming and mindfulness that I didn't realize could be solved. And, and, I, and I think that puzzle can absolutely be solved. And the point there is, it's all about our ability to have the flexibility of attention. And if we can have, uh, we can have, be flexible. And sometimes we want to not decouple our attention from our inner stream of consciousness. So, 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 what, so often people in the uh, neuroscience literature talk about executive functions, like the prefrontal cortex and its ability for working memory and attention of the outside world. But as I've tried to make the point, we can shine that spotlight anywhere. And we can shine that, it's a limited resource, but we can shine that spotlight inward and we can focus mindfully on our daydreams. That doesn't need to be incompatible with each other. It's not like you are either daydreaming or you're not mindful, right? You can be intensely mindful to your daydreams. And that's the intersection that as a creativity researcher, as a self-actualization researcher, um, and even an intelligence researcher, because I'm interested in, I have a theory called personal intelligence, which is using our intelligence applied to realizing our future goals. It's so important to be so mindful and get deeply in touch with who we actually are and what our, our thought patterns are and our future goals and our dreams and desires. Not when you have those dreams and desires, return to the breath, but to have that sort of, as you can tell, I'm a fan of open monitoring meditation, mm. as well as more controlled breathing form of meditation. That helps me a lot as well. But having all these things in the toolbox, I can, I can quite clearly see now how they're all good um, at different times. Yeah, well, the, well, the return to the breath is a concentration practice, you know, intrinsically, and you know, it is taught in the beginning just because the the major deficit for virtually anyone who starts practicing meditation is a, just a lack of concentration. You're so distracted and distractible that you can't even notice how distracted you are, and so the effort to pay attention to the breath exposes the inundation of your mind by thought, which you, you otherwise wouldn't tend to notice because you're just busy thinking those thoughts. But as you know, once you get a, a certain degree of concentration, then the practice opens up to anything else you might notice, sounds, sensations, and even thoughts themselves. Now, it is true that for the longest time for many people, there does seem to be this dichotomy between paying attention clearly, I mean, noticing what you're noticing clearly with mindfulness and thinking, right? So thought does seem to be the enemy for quite some time because it is the thing that is pulling you away or seems to be pulling you away from the practice. And it clearly is in a true concentration practice, it is the enemy because you are, you know, every moment where you're even noticing thought you're being pulled away from the object of concentration. But for mindfulness practice, in general, thoughts can ultimately, as you say, become you know, fit objects of, of mindfulness. And you know, it's quite clear that the goal is not to stop thinking and, or to block thinking in mindfulness practice. You want to recognize there's this wider space of awareness in which thoughts arise. And so the, the image that I love that I often reference from the Dzogchen teachings is that ultimately thoughts are like thieves entering an empty house. There's nothing for them to steal. And that's the, if you can describe it as a goal, that's the goal of practice is to recognize that the house is already empty and there's nothing to be distracted from. You know, there's no place from which, you know, you can be buffeted in your attention. I mean, that's when mindfulness becomes, you know, truly in, invulnerable or, or becomes recognized to be an intrinsic property of consciousness. And again, I mean, this is not something that, you know, I have stabilized in my own case, but it's, you know, I, I've done enough practice to you know, notice the non-paradox here, that there really is a place from which it's hard to say, how was it that thoughts could ever be identified with, right? Like, how is it that you could ever have felt 
that your mind was trimmed down so far that you were identical to this next thought of whatever, self-judgment, self-esteem, pride, fear, anxiety, whatever it was that has just arisen and in that moment been recognized as recognized as a mere you know, piece of language or image in this larger space of, of awareness. Identification with thought is, it is mysterious. It shouldn't be possible on some level, and yet it is our default state, or, or seems to be. Well, if there's any such thing as free will, it's, it's going to come from that, that yeah. space. Yeah, this is the space from which I, yeah, I can't make heads or tails of the claim that there might be, <laughs> it might be free will. Like, mm -hmm. like if there is. Yeah, I mean, there's just... It's, That's our only hope, though. <laughs> it's completely compatible with not understanding the concept of free will there. I agree. Can I, can I throw something at yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. So the, in work that I've been doing with David Yadin and, and others, there's two components of self-transcendence. There's this self-loss component, but there's also a connection to the, the world, the oneness mm. sort of component of self-transcendent experiences. I feel like the connection part doesn't get as much play when I feel like it should get, it, that's what should get the play. Because, that's interesting. Yeah. So I just want to throw this, this at you because what people, I had David Vago, who's a scientific researcher on, mind, on the latest science of mindfulness, and he told me something I, that just blew me away when he was on my podcast. He said, you know, we actually have no good data showing that mindfulness improves your, your feeling of connection to others or improves your social skills or improves like your feeling of, of love for others. People focus so much on all the things you just focused on when you're talking about mindfulness, the, the self-loss and the sort of ability to concentrate and the ability to, to, see your, to see your thoughts non-judgmentally and have that space, et cetera, et cetera. That part of, uh, of, of, of uh, self-transcendence. But I want to throw this at you because I've been looking at the data. Like I have data looking at the two components of self-transcendence. And we found that when you just isolate that self-loss part, from the connection part, it's actually correlated with lots of maladaptive things in life. It's correlated with um, depersonalization, disintegration, a sense of, I don't know who I am, narcissism. Mm. That was a surprising finding. We found that people scoring high narcissism actually reported imposter syndrome. They reported feeling like a, a loss of a sense of self, <laughs> of, of who they are. You know, we always, we, we tend to talk in the Buddha kind of talk like the like a loss of self is a good thing but actually in our research we found that when you isolate that from the connection part of self-transcendence that they work as a team for self-transcendence but if you isolate one from the other you actually get maladaptive things but we found across the board that when the connection part of self-transcendence is 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 high even if that is isolated from the from the other part that is correlated with, with with a whole wide swath of positive things in the world so I, mm. I throw this, this big curveball to you at the very end of our great. chat, but I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, th there's an obvious concern about just the semantics here, I mean, w whether everyone is talking about the same thing when they're using words like self or self-transcendence or a loss of self. These can mean many things, and I, and I think that the conventional sense of self can be eroded or destabilized in ways that are clearly pathological, which is to say that they clearly make people less functional and produce a lot of psychic pain, right? People are complaining about how they feel on the basis of those experiences. And I think there's no question that, you know, given the wrong wiring or given bad luck, that kind of experience can be precipitated by more or less anything. It can be precipitated by meditation. It certainly can be precipitated by psychedelics. You know, I've heard from people who have found my, my argument against free will to be totally destabilizing, right? Where I get mm. emails all in capital letters. That like, you, How you, dare you? Yeah, you know, you've, you've destroyed my life, right? I mean, <laughs> like this is just, you know, being persuaded that there might be some philosophical problem here is you know the, the ruination of their conscious lives and there's every possible proximate cause to a destabilizing experience for people so the question is what is actually happening what is the the real character of the experience when someone is suffering and what is the character of, of the experience when someone is feeling connection and experiencing states of consciousness that seem more positive or you know or more normative than one is tending to feel. I tend to think about all of this in terms of 
this distinction between consciousness and its contents. The contents of consciousness can get much more positive or much less so with the sense of self intact. You, you need right. never put your sense that you are the center of things. You are the center of your own experience. There's a rider on the horse of conscious life every moment, and, and it's me. That may never be put in question, and you can become, you know, a rage or terror filled maniac, or you can become, you know, rather like Jesus, right? Or whoever Jesus actually was. You can become someone who just feels unconditional love for people as a kind of default condition, right? And, and that's trainable, and, and you know, metta meditation is a way of training that in, in a Buddhist context where you just default to seeing the good in people and urgently wishing for their well-being. And, you know, when you see someone succeed, rather than feel envy, you just feel, you know, what the Buddhists call sympathetic joy. You just take joy and, you know, their joy becomes your joy effortlessly. You can get all of that tuned up more and more without losing the sense of self. Your self becomes more expansive and, and you're captivated by different things. You know, when you're busy hating people, you're seeing everything that's wrong with them and you're thinking about how they have, you know, you're nurturing their, your grievances against them. And, and when you're loving people, you're doing the opposite of all of that. So that's its own sort of landscape of possibility that is, in some level, orthogonal to this insight into the intrinsic centerlessness of consciousness or the illusoriness of the subject-object way of breaking each moment of perception and cognition down. And when you challenge the subject-object distinction, that does close the door to certain kinds of psychological suffering, but it doesn't do it, again, this is a moment-by-moment -moment thing. So like, I could imagine someone could lose a sense of subject-object perception and find that scary in the next moment when they're thinking about it. Like in the next moment, they might be thinking, oh my God, I wasn't there, right? There's no self. And they're not noticing that as a thought, right? And that thought is now provoking terror for them. Now they're left in the very ordinary state of mind where they're identified with thinking, their thoughts are scary thoughts, and now they're terrified. Whereas somebody else could experience this loss of self and then go on to think, you know, very positive, but also kind of grandiose and reifying thoughts about it. They could think, oh my God, there's no self, there's just consciousness. And my consciousness is the same as everyone else's consciousness. And this is what God is. God is just consciousness. And oh yeah, Deepak Chopra says this was here before the Big Bang. And now they're, they're still thinking and they're still identified with thought. And all of this is going uninspected. But these thoughts are making them happier and happier. And they're just more and more stoked to be meditators now. There's a departure point just based on the character of one's thinking and the kinds of emotions it's kindling. And again, none of that's the practice. All of that's going uninspected. None of that's actual mindfulness. But it's, you know, two very different seeming outcomes to the same, you know, moment in practice. And that doesn't exhaust everything we could say on this issue. But emphasizing the connection is not incompatible with this insight into emptiness or non-duality. But it's a different layer of practice. It's more at the level of concepts that are useful and ennobling and productive of positive affect. I mean, things like metta, you know, loving kindness or compassion, yeah. you know, thinking about nature or noticing, paying attention to things that are aesthetically beautiful and inspiring, as opposed to just seeing everything as an illusion, right? It's a slightly different game to be playing than merely rigorously equalizing all experience by noticing that there really is just nothing but consciousness and its contents. I mean, on some level, you know, if you can do that well enough, you'll find joy in and beauty in virtually anything. I mean, everything is confronting you with the irreducible mystery of consciousness in each moment. And there's something a little bit nihilistic about that, not in a depressive, let's let everything go to hell sense, but it does undermine 
some basic distinctions that most of us want to make most of the time, which is, you know, let's find beauty in the things that are actually beautiful. Yes. Let's reward real creativity rather than random splatters of paint on the wall. There, there is something to the moment where a child looks at a painting and actually I had this moment. This is, this is, here's my potted criticism of certain kinds of conceptual art or, uh, you know, certain kinds of modern art. I was with my, I guess she was maybe four or five at that point when my, my youngest daughter looked at a painting that you know, for me typifies the shell game of a certain kind of, of modern art, which is, you know, this really was just dashed off by a mediocrity. There's no deeper thought went into it. This is not, this is somebody who just managed to find a career where they get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for paintings that any child could do. And as proof of this, my four or five year old at the time looked at this painting and said, did I do that? Which is just like the New Yorker cartoonification of this whole criticism. And because it really, it was precisely the kind of thing she could have done, would have done, and we could, you know, we would have hung it up on the wall as our, as an, you know, emblematic of a four-year-old's artistic achievement. There's something to that. It's like certain things take a massive breakthrough in knowledge and intelligence and creativity and effort and everything isn't the same, right? But on one level, everything is the same. And there's something transformative about being able to punch through to that. But being permanently punched through to that is not compatible with every human aspiration. I mean, this is perhaps another paradox, but you know, Buddhas do not start software companies or put people into orbit around the planet, right? And cultures that prioritize insights into emptiness above all else may not be able to do that either. Everything I'm advocating in when I'm on the topic of meditation has to be held in tension with all the other good things we want to get done in the world, like in the, in the, in the immediate case, producing an, an effective vaccine for this coronavirus. Now, what kind of culture do you need to do that effectively? It's definitely not a culture filled entirely with monks and nuns who are doing nothing but meditate, right? Yeah. So just to respond to that, you know, it gets to the crux of the, maybe the biggest paradox Maslow was trying to grapple with his whole life. He, he saw self actualization as a bridge to self transcendence. Its function, he said, it's almost as though its function is to erase itself. That mm. quote has stuck in my head throughout writing this whole book. And, and it also made me think of the Buddhist Harvard psycho psychotherapist Jack Engler's quote. He said, You have to be somebody before you can be nobody. Mm. So I well, think well, that, well, I, the Engler yeah. quote relates to more of what we were talking about with your analogy with the boat, where it's like before you can just fly the sail of self-actualization or self-transcendence, you need an actual you know working hull that is not springing leaks every five minutes, and and there you do need the belonging and the connection and the self-esteem and all the other you know the, a healthy sense of self. That's right. And here again, you see these, you see casualties. I don't tend to reference this much, but for, you know, internal consumption, I think of casualties of the Dharma in the sense that you find people who have devoted themselves to, you know, living in an ashram or doing nothing but practice meditation without figuring out how to live satisfying lives in the world and without figuring out how to have satisfying adult relationships. And you see the distortion. I mean, again, it, this need not be true in every case. It's surely possible to become a Buddha without taking a detour into first becoming a contributing member of a capitalist society, getting wealthy, having a family, having a perfectly healthy relationship sexually, and then transcending all of that and becoming a Buddha. I mean, like if, I'm not dogmatic on the need to take the angler quote hook, line, and sinker for all it's worth. But for most people, if your commitment to practicing meditation is born of a obvious dysfunction on every other channel, and you know all the attendant psychological suffering of not finding belonging, not finding self-esteem, not finding 
a way to contribute to society where you get rewarded for those contributions. You know, it's the kinds of thoughts you will be lost in when you're lost in thought are very painful ones. And at best, it's hard to sail a boat of that sort. I just want to emphasize the, the point, the point I'm, I'm thinking here is that, you know, the point of life is not to stay in a psychedelic state your whole life. I think that's catastrophic. It seems to me what's really important is that integration is, is being able to see a vision for the way humans could be, but, but then to connect as much as you can with society and the world with that state of mind. So it really is both of those aspects of self-transcendence working in synergy with each other that's, that's important. I would agree, except connection, again, is also not a place you ever fully arrive. You know, I mean, con sure. honestly, I connection is not good enough, right? You know, love is not good enough. Relationships are not good enough. This mirage factor with everything always creeps in. I mean, like, where is your relationship to your wife? It's either in this moment or it can't be found anywhere, right? It's a story you're telling yourself. At some point, you have to, I mean, this is the, like the trump card of em emptiness keeps playing itself. There is just consciousness and its contents in each moment. And to make something more of it is to be telling yourself a story about the past and the future. And no story is good enough, right? I mean, that's no. where the dissatisfaction keeps creeping back in unless you can be satisfied with just this. I hear you. And, and I, I, there's a lot of wisdom in, in what you're saying. But I, if I took the word connection away and I used the word that Maslow used, synergy, actually, he co-opted that term from the anthropologist Ruth Benedict. Hmm synergy between self and the world. This is what I'm referring to. I'm not just talking about connection with people that you love or with people. I'm saying there's synergy between what brings you intrinsic joy in the way you're being in the world and that being impacting others. Mm. That's really what I'm referring to. That's more of an objective thing that doesn't have to do with stories that you're telling yourself. There's a great synergy. Yeah. And, um, well, we've covered a lot of ground. I, um, Sure did. I'm not sure what the the punchline is, but I really enjoyed it, and uh, thank you for for your work and for focusing on this side of um, the continuum. Because if ever we needed a a new science of self actualization, I, I think it's at, at a moment like this where so many of the impediments to our thinking from first principles are being removed. You know, for better and worse, we're at a moment where it seems that no culture has a compelling final answer to how we all should live and, and what we should aspire to. And again, we, you, you and I are having this conversation still in the midst of this pandemic, which is, has reset many people's expectations of what a successful society might look like. And um, it could all look different in a year, but the themes we've been talking about really are 